Welcome to the D list, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. I found my old shirt in the move. Ah, the big Hollywood movie studios always trying to outdo each other, usually by looking at each other's successes and desperately attempting to get these same results with significantly less effort. But as far as theme park fans are concerned, there is no studio rivalry more important than Disney versus Universal. It's a tense rivalry, but one that's good for us theme park fans, as the attraction's arms race leads to bigger and better stuff for all of us to enjoy. And yet, these two eternally opposing corporate titans have actually, at various points, shared custody of a lot of characters. Or in some cases, passed custody back and forth. Now, I'm not talking about public domain characters that both studios have adapted or acquired adaptations of, although that could be another list in and of itself. There's some fascinating stories there. Like, did you know that the Lon Chaney Phantom of the Opera used to have a presence at Disneyland? Wild, right? But no, today I'm talking about characters who are still copyrighted intellectual property who nevertheless have been purchased or licensed for appearance in both Disney and Universal products. Very rarely at the same time, although Sometimes one studio's use of a character was a reaction to the other studio's use of a character. Buckle up, kids! We're about to take a trip into the confusing world of the commodification of storytelling! Number 10. Yeah, kind of the elephant in the room, right? Universal got the theme park rights for The Simpsons a good decade before Disney bought the entire 20th Century Fox library, and let's face it, The Simpsons ride is a better tonal fit for Universal than it would be for a Disney park, even if I can't ride it without missing what came before. But Disney is really embracing their ownership of The Simpsons, even commissioning a new Maggie Simpson short to play in theaters with Pixar's Onward. You know, during the brief overlap when Onward was out and movie theaters were open. Both these megacorps see the value of The Simpsons as one of the most beloved TV shows ever made, and they're both gonna exploit it for all it's worth. So, you know, nothing's really changed. It doesn't matter which corporate overlord they're serving, The Simpsons are still gonna do their thing. Number 9. The Marvel Superheroes, and the other theme park rides elephant in the room. Kids, when I was your age, Marvel was bankrupt and would license out to anybody. Often with in perpetuity contracts that didn't give Marvel any leverage for future negotiation. But then they started making enough money from the royalties from the Sony and Fox movies of their comics to justify producing their own movies. Shortly before the entire company was purchased by Disney. But Universal already had the theme park rights to most of Marvel's most popular characters, as well as the name Marvel itself. They built a whole superhero island for Marvel and everything. Disney managed to pry the West Coast rights to the characters away from Universal, but they still can't use the name Marvel on any attractions, and Universal still has the East Coast rights for most of the characters locked down. I said most. Yeah, I'm still convinced the only reason Disney went all in on making some really good Guardians of the Galaxy movies was as part of a push to reinvigorate characters previously too obscure to be licensed out. But even before the Infinity Theme Park War, Universal had had their hands on some Marvel properties for years. The only reason non-comics readers even knew who the Incredible Hulk was is the 1978 Universal TV adaptation, and Universal still has the solo Hulk film rights to this day. That Ed Norton Incredible Hulk may be part of the MCU, but it's technically a Universal movie, with a Tony Stark cameo. But Disney has the rights to use Hulk in non-solo movies. These licenses sometimes don't make much sense. Of course, Hulk wasn't the only Marvel character to get a big screen adaptation from Universal. Just the only one they're proud of. Howard the Duck, trapped in a world he never made. A Universal release of a Marvel movie produced by Lucasfilm. Disney's just gonna buy up every company Universal has ever worked with, aren't they? Number 8. Woody Woodpecker. Okay, yeah, this one's a freebie. Universal's own mascot showed up in the Disney-produced Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Alongside other characters Universal either owns or heavily features in their parks. 
Universal didn't seem to have the same shared screen time stipulation that certain other animation studios had. Roger Rabbit is kind of the bingo free space for these sorts of crossovers, and it's such a once in a lifetime feat of licensing that Woody's presence in the film is like the 15th most interesting thing about it, but it counts. Number seven, Jay and Silent Bob. When Kevin Smith sold Clerks to Miramax, Disney's independent film wing co-founded by a since-convicted sex pest, he managed to keep the rights to the characters of Jay and Silent Bob because he already knew he wanted to use them in other movies, and he was not quite sure if Miramax would be making those movies. As a result, when Disney went behind his back to make a Clerks sitcom pilot, Silent Bob was nowhere to be seen, and Jay was replaced with... Ray. A-plus creativity there, gang. Kevin's follow-up film, Mallrats, was a production of Gramercy, which was a company co-owned by Universal and Polygram. And yes, this half-Universal production does include Jay and Silent Bob. It almost had Seth Green as Jay, if the studio had their way, but Smith stuck to his guns. But the movie flopped, so Smith went back to Miramax for Chasing Amy, and then developed the Clerks animated series for ABC and Touchstone Television. So more of Jay and Silent Bob's appearances have been with Disney than with any other single studio, but they've made detours to other studios along the way, and it all started with that one stop over at Universal. Number 6. Little Orphan Annie Little Orphan Annie is just one of dozens of cartoon characters from comic strips whose creators died before you were born that Universal licensed for Islands of Adventure's Toon Lagoon. And while she doesn't get a ride, or a show, or a major meet and greet presence, she does get her picture up at the comic strip cafe, and she was featured on Universal merch. But Annie's most famous incarnation is in the Broadway adaptation of the comic strip, and while both big screen movie adaptations of the Broadway show were produced by Sony, there was that made for TV version in 1999 that was a co-production of Sony Productions and Walt Disney Television, premiering on Wonderful World of Disney, complete with an introduction by Little Orphan Eisner. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. Also, years later, a local production of the show was the subject of an episode of Disney Plus's Encore, but that only kind of counts. Both of these productions are kind of footnotes in the Annie legacy, but so is her appearance in Toon Lagoon. I didn't say Universal and Disney would be the primary homes for all these characters, just that they have at one point been homes for all of these characters. Really, I just find it fascinating that Annie, the comic strip character, and Annie, the Broadway role, have such different places from each other in pop culture. Don't even get me started on Annie the Ovaltine spokesman. A crummy commercial? Son of a bitch. Number 5. Shaun of the Dead. Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright's Shaun of the Dead is a modern universal classic, a horror comedy that delivers on both fronts. Pegg and Nick Frost were propelled to international fame for their portrayals of Sean and Ed, two slackers who find themselves at the center of a zombie apocalypse. But later, Sean and Ed faced another apocalypse. In Danville, during the Night of the Living Pharmacists. You get touched by a pharmacist, you become a pharmacist. I mean, you can't just grow a lab coat. I don't know, perhaps the disease infects your clothing as well. Simon Pegg's Phineas and Ferb fandom is well known, and he and Nick Frost had both appeared on the show before, so... When the show was doing a Halloween special that was a parody of zombie movies, how could they not include the leads of one of the most beloved zombie comedies of all time? The special also gave a cameo to the inventor of zombie movies. They were clearly going for clout here. Sure, it might be a stretch to consider this a canonical appearance of the real Sean and Ed. It's more along the lines of pop culture characters showing up on The Simpsons. But usually in those cases, it's not the literal co-creator of the characters playing any of them, so I'm counting this. I still say this makes no sense at all. I know, right? And that wraps up part one of the top ten characters shared by Disney and Universal. Join us next week for the thrilling conclusion. Fair warning, it gets a little wild.